So welcome everybody to chapter six, where we want to talk about the open economy. This is the agenda, the structure of chapter six. And I also want to split chapter six into three different videos. So let's start with the introduction, some remarks. Open economies, they export and import goods and services from abroad and they borrow and lend in the world financial markets. This is the most important difference between a closed economy and an open economy. When we have worked through this chapter, we will talk about the accounting identity and this accounting identity reveals that the flow of goods and services across borders is always matched by an equivalent flow of capital. This is very important. We'll talk about this accounting identity a lot. In the last part, we also would like to talk about what determines the foreign exchange rate and how do protectionist trade policy affect the exchange rate. So this is more or less an overview of what's going on in this chapter number six. And um, the chapter starts with an overview, exports and imports as a percentage of output. You can see here that some countries are very open. For example, Germany is a very open economy because of the fact that the percentage of exports and imports in relation to output is relatively high. The US, however, is a very closed economy. So imports and exports as a percentage of output is relatively low. What about Denmark? I tried to find some information and here it comes. It stems from the World Bank webpage. And uh, it is the case that the exports of goods and services as percentage of GDP is at 56% and the imports are at the level of 50%. So in case that you want to include Denmark in this picture here, then to some extent, it looks a lot more like Germany compared to the US. So Denmark is a small economy and therefore the economy is also very open. In a closed economy, it was always a case that output was equal to expenditure. So output, the left-hand side was equal to expenditure and expenditure was the sum of consumption, investment and government spending. But in the open economy, it is the case that the output is sold domestically but the output is to some extent also exported. And therefore we have to add the exports on the right hand side of the equation. Some of the goods which are consumed, invested or used as government spending, they are not produced at home, but they are imported from abroad. And therefore we have to subtract the value of imports on the right hand side. And hence, in an open economy, we have the following relationship between output and expenditure. Output, the Y level, is on the left-hand side and the expenditure is giving on the right-hand side. Consumption, investment, government spending, plus the exports, minus the imports. In the following, I would like to derive a relationship where we have net exports on one hand side of the equation. Therefore, in the first step, we have to define net exports. And net exports is defined as a difference between exports and imports. Therefore, we can get rid of this difference here on the right hand side of this equation. And we are inserting net exports here. When we put C, I, and G on the other hand side of the equation, then we have isolated net exports on one hand side of the equation. And we can see here that net exports is a difference between the output and the value of domestic spending. 
So in case that one economy is producing more compared to the value of domestic spending, then this country uh, has a positive net exports and is running a trade balance surplus or a current account surplus. One example could be, for example, the German economy or the Chinese economy or also the Danish economy. They always have net exports in the positive range. One example where net export takes negative value, so where output is larger than the value of domestic spending, this is the US. In the US, uh, domestic spending is higher than output and therefore net exports have a negative value. In the following, I would like to derive a relationship between saving of the economy and net exports and therefore we have to do some modifications. So we once more start from this equation where we have output on the left hand side and these uh, components on the right hand side. We put C, G and I on the other hand side of the equation. So we are subtracting C, R, G and I and these elements pop up on one hand side of the equation. On the right hand side we have isolated the net exports. Now we add a zero to the left hand side, but not a normal zero. Zero in the form of minus t plus t on the left hand side. So we have a minus t here and a plus t there. Now we have to put some brackets around a few terms. So we put one bracket around y minus t minus c, y minus t minus c in brackets and one bracket around t minus g, a bracket around t minus g here. So now we have to check the term in brackets. The first term in brackets is private savings. Private saving is defined as gross income, then we have to pay taxes, then we are going shopping. This is private saving. The second term in brackets, this is public, public savings. The revenues from taxes minus government expenditures gives us public savings. National savings is defined as the sum of private savings plus public savings. Therefore, this term here in equation 6 is nothing else than national savings. So we can write equation 6 also in the form of equation 7. National saving minus investment is equal to net exports. So net exports is the difference between savings and investment. Net exports, this can be also regarded as the trade balance and S minus I is nothing else than net capital outflow. One economy which has a higher saving rate than the investment rate. Uh, the capital will flow to the foreign economy and therefore the left hand side of this equation S minus E can be also regarded as net capital outflow. Therefore when we look at this relationship we have net capital outflow on the left hand side of the equation and the trade balance on the right hand side of this equation. And uh, this was mentioned already in the beginning that this accounting identity reveals that the flow of goods and services across borders is always matched by an equivalent flow of capital. Like this was mentioned on one of the first slides. Like here this accounting identity reveals and then the first two bullets. So this is what we were are uh, talking about here on slide number eight. The following table once more summarizes this relationship. Um, when a country has a trade surplus, then exports are larger than imports and net exports are positive. In this case, 
the output will be larger than uh, consumption, investment and government spending, so that saving is larger than investment. It will lead to net capital outflow. Net capital outflow is positive. Let's come up with some examples for countries which fulfill like these criteria here in the first column. This could be like Germany, China or Denmark. In the last column uh, there we have um, a trade deficit. A trade deficit is characterized by a situation where the imports of goods and services is larger than the exports of goods and services so that the net exports are negative. Con the value of consumption, investment and government spending is larger than the output so that investment is larger than national savings and hence it will be the case that this country experiences net capital outflows. Net capital outflows are negative. This first subchapter ends with a statement that bilateral trade flows do not matter too much. Let's have a look at this example. It is a case that the US exports a machine to Australia for $100. So $100 are exchanging the hands and they are flowing from Australia to the US. So the US has $100 more. But then the US is going shopping. The US is buying toys from China for $100. So this $100 is flowing into China. And in the end, China is importing wheat from Australia for $100 so that the $100 note is back in Australia. All countries have a bilateral trade deficit. So Australia has a deficit against the US, US has a deficit against China, and China has a deficit against Australia. But overall trade is balanced. The overall trade balance of each country is balanced. It is not the case that the one or the other country has a trade balance deficit or a trade balance surplus. This example is used to highlight that the bilateral trade balances do not matter too much. This also becomes clear in this quote of Robert Solo. And this stems from a microeconomic perspective. So Zolo argues as follows. I have a chronic deficit with my barber. The barber does not buy a single thing from me. But this does not stop Mr. Solo from getting a haircut when he needs it. So Mr. Solo will get a haircut until the end of his life. And the bilateral trade balance between Zolo and his barber is always in red ink. Zolo has always a trade balance deficit. Is that bad? No. It's not bad because Zolo is still living within his means. This implies that Zolo has a trade balance surplus against other people. Zolo has a trade balance surplus against his university and his students where he receives money from. And therefore, this trade balance deficit, this bilateral trade balance deficit with his barber does not matter at all. This is already the end of the first subchapter. Please go back to the textbook. Have a look. Have a nice day. Bye bye.